You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys, welcome back to the Choose Fi Radio podcast. In today's episode, we are going to be interviewing the green swan. Now, what I love about that moniker is in the past, we've talked about the idea of a black swan, which would be a very rare but extremely damaging or calamitous event. And in the personal finance world, it would be a financial catastrophe. Uh, the opposite of that would be, I guess, the green swan. So uh, that would be the predictable path to wealth, which is what on this show we're all about. So we have the green swan on the show today, and we're going to be taking a fresh look at the idea of entrepreneurship. And we're going to be looking at it through the focus of actually, instead of trying to start a business from scratch or from the ground up or building one as a side hustle, actually purchasing an already existing business and reinvigorating it to become a passive income stream for you and your family down the road. So very excited to get a chance to do this today. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad, and I also have JW from thegreenswan.org. Hi, JW. How you doing today? Hey, good. How are you guys doing? I am doing fantastic. Uh, we're excited to have you on today and to explore a little bit of your story. I've been reading your content since the beginning of this year. How long have you been blogging for? Uh, it's been about a year and a half now that I started. And what was your initial light bulb moment that made you decide, oh, I think I'd like to start recording my thoughts on the WWW? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, not an easy decision, I guess. But I didn't really have a good perspective of how huge the personal finance and kind of fire blogosphere was. So when I jumped on into it, it was kind of eye opening. But I knew there was a number of folks out there like Mr. Money Mustache and just all the financial samurai and those types read all their stuff and just thought I'd just join the conversation a little bit and then was kind of blown away with how big and also how great this community is. It's just filled with great people. And how did you discover the FIRE community in general? What was your gateway to the FI community? My gateway was Mr. Money Mustache. The timing was spurred by our first kid. My wife, Lucy, and I had our first kid uh, three years ago. And at that point, I started looking into life insurance and digging into what it would cost, what kind of our cost of living was, what it would take to replace my income, her income, you know, in those tragedy kind of events. And it kind of led into, well, how much do I need period to then retire? Like if both of us didn't have an income, it just was a natural progression into that and stumbling into the retire, you know, retiring early and then the fire community. You know, I think there's something very deep here that we should just highlight. And it was your gateway to life was looking at what you would need in case of death. <laughs> there's got to be an article in there somewhere. <laughs> That's a great way to look at it. Yeah, that's well said. And I think that's an interesting point in that when you actually get quotes for life insurance, I know speaking from personal experience, this was actually one of my kind of seminal moments as well, JW. So it's really is interesting. You know, you get this insurance agent come in and they start quoting, oh, you need a $2 million policy. I mean, that was what the guy told me. And I did the exact same thing as you, which was look at what, what would happen if I actually died. And all right, pay off the mortgage, pay for college, and we already have X number of dollars saved up. So, I mean, to imagine that I needed a $2 million policy was pretty laughable. I'm, I'm curious what that agent, I mean, did you speak with an agent or, or did you just do it on your own? Yeah, I didn't even make it to an agent. I was looking at those same considerations, the mortgage, college, and then some sort of a estimate for what the kid would cost. You know, there's those estimates put out by the U.S. government and just thinking through those added lifestyle costs of having a kid. And if it's $500,000 or $750,000 policy or something like that, it's like, well, I don't think I'm necessarily the, the normal person out there that doesn't have any savings. I already have five hundred dollars to $750,000 saved. 
you know, why do I need this policy? And that was kind of my train of thought. Yeah, that's cool. That's the exact same conclusion I came to. And yeah, those numbers you quoted, I think are basically exactly what we got for our own policies. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. So we uh, ultimately sidestepped it. We have small policies provided by our employers that will basically just cover the cost of putting us into the ground. I guess it's kind of morbid, but you know, other than that, I feel like we're kind of near phi and so are good to go. So we talked about what that thought process was. How old were you when you discovered the Phi community? Uh, I would put it around 27-ish. Okay. And as a follow-up question to that, when you look back at your pre-Phi and post-Phi and you're comparing the two, was there was it a 180 or when you look back at your decisions through specifically high school, college, and those early 20s, do you view those as stepping stones that made this goal very doable or did you have to make any drastic changes? No, no, no real drastic changes. It, it was sort of a perfect stepping stone along the path. Discovering fire, I just kind of tightened the screws a little bit more on just the lifestyle decisions. My wife and I, we've always been kind of cost conscious frugal. We did a lot of the right things from that standpoint. There's things we could have improved, but we saved early. We weren't frivolous with our money. And so we were kind of on the natural progression right out of college. All right, JW. So it sounds like you've been frugal since the beginning, but we are always looking for actionable tips. Do you have anything specifically with like college or anything right after you graduated, house hacking and anything like that that you could pass along to the audience? Yeah, I think the one perhaps unusual step in my journey was with college. I went in with the mindset of wanting to get in and get out and then get out into the world making money. So I wanted to spend less time spending money in college and then get out into the world and make money as soon as I could. So I went in with the mindset of graduating in three years. I took summer classes at community colleges to kind of get build up those extra credits and get it done on time. So that was the one kind of actionable tip I would I would throw out there and on my journey that helped me a lot. So you said mindset a couple of times and, and that's fascinating to me. Talk me through. So you're a 17 year old kid at that point, right? When you've already yeah. made the decision, hey, I want to save on college. I'm going to go to the community college. Like, do yeah. you recollect, put yourself back in your shoes then, like, do you recollect how that even came up? Did you have role models? Did your parents talk about money? That's a great question. I know you guys like to talk about second generation fire. I may have been kind of an incidental second generation fire without really realizing it, but my dad was always there as a role model for me. And he passed along a lot of the tips and tricks that we talk about in the community today. He he house hacked when he got out of college and he did he did a lot of things that helped kind of prepare me for that in high school i was you know with guidance and advice and everything from my parents i took advanced courses to get college credits i took clep tests to kind of get some of those extra credits so i went into college with boy a semester at least of college credits already and then took it the extra step with the summer courses to push me over the edge so so yeah i think it is all about the mindset and I may fall into the uh, the second generation fire for you. I love that we're addressing this idea of mindset because the typical mindset, what I heard uh, in my undergrad days was graduating college in four years is like leaving the party at 10 o'clock. That is the <laughs> normal perspective on how to approach college. It's all about the experience, man. And you start from scratch. If you're lucky and you're aggressive, finally having paid off your student loans and now finally being broke or back to even at the age of 30. So I guess what I'm saying is as a broad generalization, I think your approach makes way more sense, especially for the Phi community where we realize that time is precious. Well, I can tell you, I didn't leave the party at 10. The nice thing about graduating early is you're out, you're actually making money. I had a little bit more money to spend at the party for those last <laughs> last couple of years. So I'd turn that a little bit. Yeah. Nice pivot, man. Well played. Okay. So you've graduated college. It sounds like you're doing things, you know, generally right. Although maybe not as intentional as, as you could be at the age of 26. That's when you discover Phi. Looking back, I guess we all have a path that we've chosen. What was your path to actually achieving Phi? Do you focus on tax optimization? Do you focus on increasing income? How did you tackle this game? The frugal, the frugal life was kind of there from the beginning. But the way I have tackled it is more from the income side. I did a lot to boost my career, to develop my career. And that that came in um, going back to school to get an MBA. I had an older sibling that was a role model of mine in helping me develop my career. He's in a similar field as me. And I know another thing that you guys have talked a lot about is parlaying relationships and partnerships. 
And one of those things for me that has helped a lot is that relationship with my older brother. And so that relationship with my older brother, one of the things that we talked in the past, we had talked a lot about was going into business together, developing a business, buying a business, and using that to help fuel our returns as well. Because small businesses have a special characteristic. They're they're really hard to incorporate into your fire journey or your wealth building journey because it you know, you need to have a manager. Is that you? But small businesses can be great because they can provide a much greater return than you would normally expect. Kind of the risk return trade off there. They're going to be more risky, but they're going to get a better return. And so for me and my older brother, it was just how, how can we incorporate that? How can we do that? And finding the right opportunity uh, took us a while. But eventually we were. And just just last year, a little over a year ago, we we ended up me my older brother, my two younger brothers all went into business together. So JW, that's really cool. When did you first start having these conversations with your brother? I mean, is this something that has been going on for years or, and I guess also, is he familiar with the Phi community? Have you guys talked about this? Is he a big saver as well? He's a big saver. I don't think he's as familiar with the FIRE community. You know, for instance, he doesn't know that I even have this blog, but he's kind of a natural five person just in the background. He's a saver. He's made a lot of money in his career, still does, and definitely is Phi. He's just chugging along. But what got us into the business, that's something that we had been talking about more or less just kind of off and on since we were both out of college, but something we had always joked about even as kids. I remember going on vacation down to the Gulf and being on the beach and we were joking around talking about, gosh, how nice would it be to just own a hotel resort just right here on the beach? So, I mean, we even had small conversations like that as kids. You know, what strikes me is, how this story that we have tried to tell and that you're telling on your blog as well, and it's focused on personal finance, but how perfectly in parallel it runs to just the entrepreneur storyline. And it reminds me so much of the Robert Kiyosaki book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and which he describes this idea of this cash flow quadrant. And without breaking that down, the thing that strikes me is that while most of the world focuses on buying stuff, which is a one-way street, your money leaves your pocket in exchange for just an item, the FI community, the entrepreneur community, We focus on purchasing assets and we do this different ways. We either focus on purchasing a portion of the economy by buying index funds or in your case, and I think in the case of many other people that we'll be able to highlight in the future, you start focusing on either building businesses from scratch or it sounds like in your case, you're actually buying an existing business, but but not a franchise. You're not buying into a franchise. You're actually buying an individual business. And Rich Dad, Poor Dad was one of the initial books that I read out of college. And it developed the idea in my mind of building multiple income streams. So you have the one cornerstone kind of W2, that's easy. But what what else can you do to layer on other income streams? And going into business, a small business, especially for me, it's more or less on the side. It's not part of my day to day. That adds another dimension. Yeah, I think it makes the game more interesting. All of us are going to at some point have the W2 income. We're going to have that figured out. But the question is, are you just going to stick with that and just focus on those one to 3% raises, you know, and, and if you go back to our ESI episode, clearly people have figured out how to leverage that into more, but is that the path you're going to choose? Or are you going to focus on instead of that, building these multiple income streams and then just using, finding other people that have done it, finding role models of people that have done it and then positioning yourself to be able to get into that lane. And so I am curious, you know, as a follow-up question, how did you go about positioning yourself to be ready for this opportunity? Yeah, it's over time and it's all about finding the right opportunity because that doesn't come easy. We looked at a number of businesses and it's just a matter of finding the right fit and uh, you know the right purchase price really. So we we saved money. Lucy and I saved money. My older brother saved money. My younger brother saved money. And so it was investing in our 401ks, IRAs was always part of the plan. And then it's that extra over the top that we put into our taxable savings that was more or less our dry powder for these opportunities. And when that came last year for us, it was a huge liquidation of that taxable savings investment account and sending the biggest wire I've ever sent before over to buy then this business. That's got to be an adrenaline rush. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, you go into the bank and it's like, geez, what are they going to think when I'm asking to send 
this wire? Like, you know, what kind of questions am I going to get asked? Because it's just not a, a normal thing, I don't think. So talk me through, if you don't mind, like the actual process of researching businesses. So it sounds as if you guys were just interested in buying a business generally, and mm -hmm. you're just doing research and due diligence. So you have the whole world essentially of potential yeah. businesses. Like, how did you cull it down? How did you do research? And how did you feel confident that, you know, you could do that without an advisor or without, you know, someone to help you facilitate this mm -hmm. purchase? Like, you know, talk me through the actual thought process of, of how this all works. Yeah, it, it sounds sounds complicated, but it doesn't necessarily have to be too complicated. There's a lot of good resources out there. There's online brokers, there's local regional brokers, they're, they're business brokers. It's kind of a concept that, you know, many people may not be aware of, but just like real estate brokers, but you know, there's business brokers out there and that's, that's who we work through. And then the next step in kind of sifting through and finding the right one over time and by location and geography and everything that we wanted. The next step is the on-site due diligence. So that would include me or one of my brothers going out to the business itself. And it's kind of a deep dive on financials, on operations and next steps and equipment, machinery, just everything, just kicking the tires. And that's part of the process. I mean, like buying a home, is tough because things can fall through sometimes if it doesn't work out or you don't find it or someone else gets to it first. A lot of the same things go into buying a business. And so it can just take time. And that's that was the case for us. So how did you find that business broker that that you felt you could trust? I think just actionable tip wise, like where did you find your business broker? Did Were you limited to your own local city, town, metro area, or did you go further afield? And how did you vet that person? I think we ultimately found, uh, I think the business broker that we ultimately used was an online one. I, and if I recall correctly, it was Sunbelt. We we looked at a number. We weren't committed to any single business broker, but we were searching all, all of them more or less. And so when we found the business, we then contacted, you know, from the Sunbelt website and initiated the the discussions and the diligence. Was there a industry or set of industries that you were particularly interested in because you had a comfort level with that? Or were you truly just looking for a, a series of numbers that met, met the math criteria that you were looking for? It, there wasn't a, a tight framework for us. It, it would have been great if it was a business that was sort of easily understandable for us to run or manage or to have key operations folks as part of the business that we're staying on that could kind of help us learn the ropes. I think that was the biggest key for us is we, the collective of us brothers felt that we could run a business if we were kind of showed the ropes a little bit and then had key personnel kept with us to help us as well. And so that was, that was more or less the biggest focus is transition of ownership and maintaining those operations than any key type of industry or business line. So a lot of it was numbers based and then operations based and transitioning the management over time. So I'm trying to imagine the scale that you walked into because, you know, it's very easy for me to imagine just coming up with an idea and it may work or it may not work, but you start it, you add an employee here or there, it grows either organically or you have these surges. But to me, that's a very stark contrast from having a business that's viable, that's in place, that clearly is spitting out some profits or at least has the potential to spit out profits. It's turnkey more or less. And you're coming in and now you're acting, you're coming in, you're looking at the team that's already in place and you're figuring out how can I optimize this further? How many people are on this team and of this business that you guys acquired? Is this a 250 person operation? Is it a five person operation? Yeah. For us, it's all about stepping in, how to optimize and then how to grow it. And, and a lot of that is adding staff off the top of my head. I'm not involved closely with the day to day, but I'm involved very regularly still with the business week to week. We started with, I'd say, roughly a dozen. And just the way this business went for us, most of those have, have turned over and we've gotten in more or less a lot of the the kind of right folks, I think, to take it to the next step. And we've added staff, it has grown, but there's a, so a little bit of a transition period for us. So it's it's probably like in the 20 employee kind of ballpark right now. So JW, I, I'm just putting myself in the, in the shoes of one of your employees, right? So 
I'm working at this company and all of a sudden ownership just shifts completely. And there's this set of brothers coming in and naturally people are going to be nervous, scared. What did you guys do from like a cultural perspective to, to allay those fears? And did you have conversations with each of your employees? Did you deal just like with the management that was in place, like talk me through like what that transition looks like. Cause I, I think that's important for people, not only looking to purchase businesses, but uh, employees as well. When they, when they see this kind of turnover in ownership. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great, great question. When we came in, the business that we bought was somewhat of a turnaround. It was actually a little bit more of a turnaround than we, we initially realized or expected. And so the way we came into it in meeting with the employees, and a lot of this was my my younger brothers who who run the day to day, is you know, meeting with the employees, allaying the fears that, yeah, we're not we're not here to, you know, fire you. We're here to do the exact opposite. We want to put in um, steps and incentives and focus on growth. And that was one of the keys for us. It was the prior management was stale. I think a little bit, not really overly focused on the business or the employees. And I think we were more of a breath of fresh air. And I think they quickly realized that as the employees, they quickly realized that, yeah, you know, we can do a lot better with this business with the right incentives. They can get paid more and, you know, we can all benefit when this business grows. And so that was the kind of culture that we wanted to put in place you know, you're, you're either with us or you're not. And so that led to some turnover. Um, some folks, I, you know, change isn't easy for everyone, I, I, I think, um, safe to say. And it was getting the right people on board and, and then building this business together. And that was kind of the frame set that we, we went in with. Nice. I, I like that a lot. And and just going back to the actual purchase. So usually you're, you're going through this broker and there are X multiples of the purchase price is a multiple of, let's say, net income or some such, you know, and that's yep. just kind of like a background. Right. But did you guys look specifically for something that you could add value to and really see hopefully the growth significantly in the first couple of years. And also like, how did you know that you and your brothers could add value to this particular company or any of the companies you were looking at? Yeah, exactly. We had a little bit of insight into the, the kind of industry or the business and the local economy and, and kind of where our geographic footprint was, the size and the demographics. It was a growing community. So we felt like there was a lot of good pluses there for us to grow. And then with the help and insight from others already in the in the industry that we knew or were able to contact and build relationships with really kind of helped us build the framework to see where and what this business could become. So I think we we have some aspirational goals. We haven't hit them. It's only been a year. I think we've been treading water for a lot of the time. And I think we're starting to hit our stride at this point. So you guys are treading water, you're breaking even, and now you're moving into the positive. You're moving into the green, which is the color that I think you're a fan of, uh, <laughs> as, as am I. But I'm curious, you know, as an owner, you obviously have lots of options with how you structure things. How did you choose to structure this? And maybe even more specifically, where do you guys go from here? Yeah, it's it's all about optimization, as is everything with the FIRE community. We've structured things specifically for us. Our business is structured as a LLC ownership, and that provides a, a number of tax benefits to us individually uh, and for the business. Small businesses generally have some pretty good tax advantages in being able to run and operate them. Uh, but the the next step for us is now that we've moved into the great color of green is building that passive income. And it doesn't stop with just this business. This is not the end all be all for us. It's the next step. And one of the things that we've been looking at in the last, I'd say, three months is how can we leverage this into our next acquisition? And we've been looking very closely and working really closely with a related business geographically close to us that we can uh, buy. He's looking to sell it and we're, we're actively negotiating with him as we speak. Just these last couple of weeks, it's really picked up. So that's the next step for us is building the business organically and then also through acqui- you know, further acquisitions and, and optimizing it further, building the passive income stream. And, you know, certainly with the background of having it structured legally as, you know, tax advantageous as possible. 
So I love that you at being centered in the FI community at tackling this problem. And frankly, you're bringing up an idea that we haven't really discussed on the show yet. Although obviously we see the value in it. We've touched on the idea of a side hustle, but typically the side hustle, when, when I think of it, I'm thinking of starting something from scratch. I love that acquisition is a real possibility. And if you take this kind of ultra optimizer stance that a lot of the FI community intrinsically understands and apply that to any situation, it changes the framework. So it's been a goal of mine to also start multiple income streams. And obviously I have put a lot of time and energy into building Choose FI. And that was a massive project for me over the last year. And becoming the owner of a business gives you a chance to explore all these creative tax strategies that you just don't have access to as just a W-2 employee. And so really the story that you're telling is, is very compelling. And I think it's going to present you with a lot of really cool options down the road. Yeah, exactly. And I, I couldn't have done this. Um, you know, it's tough for a lot of people just going in from scratch. I couldn't have done it without my brothers. And my two younger brothers are, are the ones who are really running the day to day on site, in location, et cetera. And I couldn't do it without without them. I'm more or less just kind of the, my contribution is more of the monetary and then just kind of on the side a little bit. So it is, it's taking the side hustle, putting it on steroids a little bit, but not something that I could necessarily do by my, at this stage, still with an active W2, nine to five kind of busy job. But it's something that in the future, like as you're saying, as I reach FI, as I maybe enter retirement, become more and more involved and even something, if you look down the road, that second generation fire, something that my my two kids can you know potentially even get into if you're looking really far down the road. I mean, it could be their summer job. It could be you know something that they grow into as well. So there's a lot to it. It, it can become a lot more. Uh, it, I think we're definitely just in the early stages, but it has the potential to to be levered in many other different ways that everyone in the FI community really likes to talk about. And and then even for myself, it could be my part-time gig in retirement, You know, working 10 to 20 hours or whatever I want. So you talked about passive income, obviously, and the potential to, as you just stated, kind of pick up more hours as you move out of a W-2 job. But, you know, talk me through, like, what what is the ultimate goal? Like, as I'm hearing, you're purchasing a new company, potentially, in, in a similar or related industry. Your two younger brothers work basically full time on this on this job, on this company. Like, talk me through, like, what what does the path look like in the next, I don't know, 10 years for the whole set of brothers like is is this a passive income play for all of you like do you fully anticipate your younger brothers to stay on as as the real day-to-day operations long term or like how, how does that work and then i guess you know as a as a side question like how does the sibling dynamic work it's it's such a loaded thing for many people to really work with their family and it's it's potentially fraught with a, a lot of dangers right so it sounds like you guys are navigating this quite well. So I'd love to just hear a your plan and b like how it works with the family. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great question. I don't think any of us four brothers are necessarily all on the same path or stage in life or anything like that and it's been a fluid process for us. For my two younger brothers, the future prospect for them is continued employment and their owners as well, but you know, that's kind of the big thing for them. I don't know that we have necessarily an end goal in mind. I think a lot of folks, if you just put it on a, a parallel track with real estate ownership, you can either sell or you can just keep collecting that rent check. So I think we're still in the building phase. You know, we're adding, we're growing, building the passive income. And then it's, you know, do we keep running it and optimizing it? Or once it's fully optimized and kind of as big as we want, and, you know, do we cash out, sell it and do something else with that money then? I think that's a, that's a question for down the road, uh, not something that we've ever really talked about in great depth or anything. And then for me individually, do I want my money kind of tied up in that business for the long term? Maybe, um, but maybe I want it back sometime. Maybe I want to live on that in retirement. And the the potential for that is there as well. My brothers could buy me out, for instance. So I think there's uh, a number of different avenues that that could go. And I think we're all just open and fluid to that recognizing that we're still in the early innings though. And then the I think the second part of your question there is how how we as brothers the the whole relationship dynamic. Uh, I can tell you that that's been on the forefront of our minds. Our family has kind of had some history with that. My grandpa was in business with his brother and things kind of went sour and you know they never talked to each other again, just 
it's a horrible deal. So we, we've entered this with our eyes kind of wide open to that. We're very careful. I mean, we've definitely had some very <laughs> heated discussions, I, I think, as a lot of business uh, partners would. But I think what's our benefit is we are brothers. And at the end of the day, we're still coming back together and, you know, talking about the awesome barbecue that we just fried up or, you know, whatever else afterwards. So we can have heated, frank discussions. And, you know, we're ultimately still brothers and we know that and we all have the best interests, uh, uh, you know, our collective interests at heart. So, so far, so good. Uh, the bottom line is, though, that we love running this business together. The the goal is that it can be something fun for us all to do together and kind of build and grow. And so that's that's the focus. That's great. And certainly with your grandfather, while clearly that's that's a negative issue for the family as a whole, or it has been, uh, at least that made you guys go into this, like you said, with eyes wide open. And I, I think that's really important. And I'm also curious, like, do you have any tips for the audience who who may go into business with a family member or a good friend? Is there anything that you guys put into place? Well, it's all well and good to say, hey, we're brothers. And at the end of the day, we're all going to barbecue and everything is going to be great. Right. Like that's, that, yeah. that sounds wonderful. And, and I hear you. And, and that is that is the bedrock part of the, of the relationship. Right. But like, yeah. did you guys like hire a lawyer and put into place like an operating agreement that might say like, Hey, if I want to get cashed out someday, here's what happens. Like, did you guys go yeah. through those, those steps just to safeguard yourselves? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. We, we went into it eyes wide open, you know, that's all good and dandy, but up front, I think we all needed to be clear and open with uh, each other on the expectations. And we were, and then we built in a framework, just like you said, into the operating agreement that covered every situation basically that you can imagine, like divorce, for example, if any one of us, you know, three of us, four brothers are married. So, you know, from an ownership standpoint, what would happen if a divorce happened, you know, and we dispelled everything that we agreed, we talked about it and then spelled it up, uh, wrote it up on paper just so that we had the framework you know, we're all on the same page and can make it easy to navigate those situations if we need to. Same for me, like if I or any of one of us brothers wanted to exit or a bigger deal would be like one of my two younger brothers no longer want to be involved in the day to day. They want to do something else. We spelled out a framework for how we can tackle those issues. That's fantastic. And yeah, I would highly, highly advise everyone in the audience thinking about going into business with family yeah. or friends to to really hear what JW is saying. And like this, it it's important. It's really essential to sit down and talk through all those eventualities at the beginning, because you, the last thing you want to happen is eight years into the business, someone wants to leave or something happens in their lives and now you're scrambling. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's really important. Life, life changes. Exactly. And the issue of potential conflict arising is real. So I think people that would enter into business, especially with family, but just even with good friends or, or other relatives is recognizing that, you know, one is being the, the key step in and then building a framework to handle that. And yeah, being open and honest upfront and throughout communication is key. There's challenges. So going in without realizing that or recognizing that is just being set up for failure, I think, right from the beginning. So there's there's hazards that can be avoided and should be avoided just up front. So I want to frame this as the trade-off, and, and I'm just going to read this, this single paragraph you have here. The goal of this business or the expectation is to make outsized returns. And you wrote in this paragraph that you mean for the business value to grow well in excess of the 7 to 8% returns the S&P 500 generates over the long term. And your personal goal and expectation is to double that around 15% annually. And while the industrial service business has started off a little bit slower than expected, you've met or exceeded your budget in each of the last six months with continued momentum. And it's been a very strong, stable performer. So it's one of those situations where you're putting yourself out there to a little bit more exposure, but more risk, more reward. And it's a calculated risk. Having said that, I think this is the part of the story where we should probably talk about some of the unexpected joys of small business ownership. <laughs> Do you want to take a few minutes and tell us about a few of the surprises that you had since you started this business? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's been some great, I mean, you can't make up some of the stuff that we've experienced. It's it's blown my mind, really. But I think that's part of the 
nature of the type of business. You know, we a lot of our employees are making the hourly wages in the mid teens or to the twenties. Um, so it's somewhat of a blue collarish type of job, and we've definitely experienced a lot of employee type issues, and then just other just crazy instances. One kind of just really dangerous one was one of our trucks in the in the, in our parking lot. The brakes, the brake pads just stopped working. So fortunately, the the car wasn't going that fast, and they were able to get it stopped. But the brake pads just fell off the car. Holy crap! I mean, it's just like those type of things that are just ridiculous that we had to deal with. And then we had an employee that was intoxicated, middle of the night, got into a car crash. Everyone was safe and fine, um, but it was a hit and run. And so, and it was with our our corporate truck. Um, <laughs> Not ideal. So it got like our truck got impounded. And so we were without our truck for a while, of course, without that employee as well. A couple other instances, we were running a background check on a potential new hire. And it turned out that uh, he was a sexual predator. So uh, you run into complications when trying to hire people for the most unexpected issues. So that didn't work out. And then the last one I'll kind of mention is we've even had employees stealing from us and that we've caught on security cameras and then had to lay off. We noticed things were missing. So it's just the craziest things that I can't imagine why people think they can get away with some of this stuff. But, you know, it's nothing really is come super easy, I think, for a small business owner. You really have to put up with a lot. And I, I give the credit again to my two younger brothers who deal with the brunt of it and then, you know, kind of relay the message on to to us and you just shake your head a little bit. It's like, oh boy, well, and, you know, it's a matter of, Okay, well, you know, the car is impounded. You know, what can we do? What's what can we do to, like, get this back on track? What do we need to do to to fix this and move forward? You have to start by picking your jaw up off the floor and reattaching it. (laughs) Yeah, I told told my wife that, oh, honey, you wouldn't believe this. But one of our cars was involved in a hit and run. And she's like, oh, no. Well, did they catch the guy? (laughs) I was like, well, well, you know, honey, it was actually us. It was our guy. <laughs> oh, man. It wasn't the other guy, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, her jaw was on the floor, too. But having said that, you guys have put the time in and you feel, at least at a personal level, that you've had an impact on the culture of your business. You've improved the operations, you've improved the numbers, and you've started to develop these relationships with other related businesses. And that is. In and of itself, the fact that you now have this 12-month track record of doing this is opening up some some new opportunities for you, right? Yeah, exactly. When you step outside the box and you challenge yourself and do things like this, you're often rewarded with new opportunities. And we've definitely seen a couple that have come across our path. We're hoping that this acquisition that's kind of in the works right now works out. It will be a big endeavor for us. It will definitely challenge us a lot again, financially and just operationally, but it's, it's all part of the plan. It's all part of the growth plan, building up what comes down to being a a passive income stream for us all. Yeah. So you mentioned the growth plan. I'm curious, I guess, a, how you're funding this purchase of the new company. Is it coming out of business profits from the existing company or you and your older brother putting in the money for most of it. How does that work? Yeah, this new potential company is about our size, a little bit bigger, actually, maybe uh, about one and a half our size. So it's going to require a lot of money up front again. It would be another big check from me and my older brother, even more than the initial one. And then the the other kind of gap to fill there is bank debt. And the other part of it is hopefully relying on the, the selling owner to put seller financing in it and so become kind of a, a debtor to us as well. So we'll have bank debt, seller financing from the owner, and then our capital, more capital that we would then inject into the business as well. And I, I guess my question B would be your long-term FI path, right? Like what is what does that look like for you? Do you do you have a sense of if this business acquisition goes well then I can transition out of my job in X number of years? Or like, is your fire path related to these businesses? Or, or are you going to hit your FI goal completely irrespective of, of what goes on? And then this is passive income. Like, have you thought through how that works? Yeah, I think my FI goal is 
is irrespective of how the business does, I'll probably hit phi in, in a handful of years, maybe five or six years, my wife and I. The the business, I don't know about the the passive income stream or how that will be incorporated into phi, but ideally we'll have that kind of on the side or as as icing on the cake to our you know taxable brokerage account and our retirement accounts that will then be the the primary basis for our financial independence. Okay, cool. So as I'm hearing it, you are calculating your FI number just completely separately, right? So you take your annual expenses, you figure out whatever withdrawal rate, whether it's three or 4%, somewhere in that vicinity, and you're going to have that in your investments between your 401ks and your taxable investments, et cetera. And you know, that's your FI number. Am I hearing you right? Yeah, that's exactly right. How the business incorporates that it is something that we can kind of decide down the road. But the business right now, as it stands, makes up maybe you know 25% of my net worth ballpark. So we're looking to build our retirement accounts to live on on the side. Wow. I guess so, it's probably simple. I mean, it's it's down the road, so we have time to decide. Things are, uh, you know, may change, but that's kind of the way we're looking at it. That's very interesting. So yeah, I mean, that is like the most conservative FI plan I've ever heard. That's that's wonderful. I mean, it's almost a zero percent chance you're going to have any issues if you've hit FI just based on the general calculation, and then have these businesses which yeah. are quote unquote on the side, right, and are still bringing in money and are worth a significant amount. So I mean, that's that's like a can't lose proposition. Yeah, I mean, the big the big picture is though with those businesses, will they actually kick out money and be passive income for me on the side? Or will we continue to invest, reinvest that into the business by buying more businesses or just organic growth? So I don't necessarily want to rely on that as income. You know, shoot, the businesses could fail too. So it is really conservative. But I, but I think it does allow you to operate from a place of strength. It, it does. I think it, it adds a lot of potential strength to the, the overall picture. And I also think that that ends up helping your relationship with your brothers as well. And I think in general, partnerships that are operated from a place of strength tend to be more viable long term, as opposed to operating from scarcity, where everyone is trying to figure out where that next meal is going to come from or how to keep the lights on. It tends to make you tend to make more irrational decisions, which lead to more conflict. Yeah, I would I would kind of envision the business as look at that as its own entity on its fire journey. I mean, the business is in the in the early innings, as I kind of said before, it's similar to, you know, the person on their FI journey right out of college. They don't really know where it's going to go. And that's kind of how I view it. I don't really know where it's going to go or what it will become. It may be absolutely great, glorious, and like a huge nether passive income for me, you know, or it may take a lot longer to develop or, you know, not necessarily develop. So it, it'll be interesting to kind of watch it grow and develop. There's a lot of unknowns and unforeseen things that could come up down the road, but it's kind of on, I'm kind of viewing it on its own path. JW, thank you so much for just taking the time to share this story with us. What I love about it is that we're capturing this not from someone that has done this and been wildly successful, but from the eyes of someone that's willing to stretch themselves, take action, and try something new. And we all get to benefit from this choice that you've made. This is a totally different look at entrepreneurship. And many times, in many cases, we focus on the idea of just starting this multiple income stream or this passion project from scratch, right? But you don't necessarily have to have the perfect idea in order to get into the business world. You can do what JW did and either just look for a business to acquire on your own and then reinvigorate it, or maybe bring in strategic alliances and partnerships. That's kind of what Brad and I did and use your different skill sets and abilities to do something together. So this is just a remarkable look at how that comes together. And then long-term, what I love about it is Brad and I are planning on using this platform to share this information with you guys over the next several years, minimum. So I imagine that JW is going to continue to gain traction with this and we'll be able to bring you back on the show, maybe to talk about some of your other content. But when we're doing that, we're also going to be able to look at this project and continue to learn from what you're doing, which is just a really, really cool look at this overarching story. Yeah, it is. It is kind of a still in the baby phase. So it, we've done a lot and kind of achieved a lot, but it's not a huge like integral driver of our FI necessarily, you know, but it has the potential to be the contributor. So absolutely, man. I uh, couldn't agree more and just really, really excited for you. Well, before we let you go today, we want to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Yes, definitely ready for the hot seat. Let's do it. Okay. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, 
trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation? These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. It gives me chills. <laughs> yes. Me too, man. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So question number one is your favorite blog that's not your own. I, I would list um, two blogs in this category. I really enjoy reading the Financial Samurai's website. Uh, he's he's a high finance guy. He talks about some more complicated and in-depth personal finance matters and has very in-depth and well thought out articles. I've just really enjoyed reading his site. And the plus side, he's he's one of the other few fellow bankers by trade out there that in the blogosphere, just like myself. So I uh, really enjoy his stuff. And then the other one I would throw out there is ESI Money. And I know you guys have had him on the podcast. He's he's a great role model for the FIRE community. He's done it right, built his career well. He's a family man, has two kids. I think he just retired a year or so ago, and he he has some great stuff on his blog. I, I really is, especially like his uh, his millionaire interview series. So he puts out some great stuff as well. I'd throw both of those blogs right in there at the top. Yeah, uh, Sam's actually someone that's been on my radar. And I was thinking in particular, I know he's put some time and thought into crafting a strategy for negotiating a severance package, which I feel like could be a really useful tool for someone that's planning their exit strategy. So I would love to bring him on the show at some point. And then ESI, I'm a huge fan of, and I completely agree. I love his millionaire interviews. And I also love all of his content on career hacking. I mean, I know we did a post on it, but he has way more on his blog about that topic that really deserves to be explored. So if you're in your career and you're looking for a way to optimize that path, the income strategy, he has a roadmap to guide you beginning to end for that process. And he capped out being the president or CEO of a $100 million company. So you couldn't ask for someone better to give you that inside advice on how to climb that corporate ladder in the most efficient way possible. And some of us are on that path. So for those of you that are tackling this game that way, spend some time on his blog. You'll absolutely get value from it. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. I might throw a curveball to you on that one. I would actually go to a podcast and and not to uh, uh, toot your guys' horn too much, but I'd throw it out to one of your guys' podcasts back when you guys had, yeah, episode 18 and 18R, when you guys had Go Curry Cracker on. He really opened up my eyes to a lot of the tax hacks that you can employ before and leading into retirement. So that was really eye-opening. Great, great stuff. Yeah. My mind, th- those were concepts that I had been aware of, but those two episodes, one, just talking to Go Curry Cracker about it, cemented it for me, but then also doing that, uh, that case study that we did in 18 R where we walked through it, like yeah. getting a chance to actually talk through that process was a total light bulb moment for me as well. Uh, yeah. Thanks for giving us a shout out on that one. Yes. It just really crystallized things for me. It was great. Nice. All right, cool. So number three is your favorite life hack. Um, I have a a small one, but a recent one that I picked up just a few months ago, and that is listening to podcasts and audiobooks at two times speed. (laughs) There's so many great podcasts and and books uh, that I like to read and listen to. And being able to put them on two times speed, just obviously it's a, it's a game changer from an efficiency standpoint. So that's been really helpful for me. Yeah. And I also listen to podcasts in sped up time. I generally can't comprehend it at, at two times speed, but I move between like 1.6 and 1.8, depending on the podcast that I'm listening to. So I think that's a really good life hack. And it, it's funny when I do have our own podcast in one time speed, I listen to it. I'm like, oh my goodness, do I really talk that slowly? Like it, it's actually painful for me. So <laughs> that aside to the audience, I definitely would suggest like just start speeding it up a little bit, even like 1.2, 1.3, see what you can, what works for your own brain, I guess. Yes, and then see if you can speed it up because it, it allows you to get more in in, in less time, which is a, a, a big win. All right. Uh, question number four, your biggest financial mistake. We've kind of talked, I guess, a little bit about my journey and my wife and I's journey. We didn't make a whole lot of mistakes, I don't think, kind of coming out of college and on our path. But mistakes can be things that we did wrong or things that we failed to do. And I think one of the things that we failed to do or wish we could have uh, incorporated into our journey was the house hacking. I mentioned how my dad introduced me to the the concept. He did it. He rented out a bedroom over top of his garage. It was a separate unit. 
And it just made sense. And it was something that I was aware of, but just never found the opportunity to implement. We moved a couple of times after college. And so it was, we just never had the right situation. And now that we have a family, we've, we've kind of grown into, you know, wanting the lifestyle of our own house. And it's something I wish we would have incorporated. Uh, it's a great hack. Couldn't agree more. I think Brad and I both feel like we just missed that window and it's probably not ever going to happen for us at this point. But like I constantly talk to my younger siblings that are in this life stage where it might be feasible. And I, I, I just think that is absolutely something that a second generation Phi kid, you know, growing up in our community with the role models that we have, this is a lever you should pull. Couldn't agree more. All right, JW, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Uh, right out of college, I was what you'd call a tightwad. I had the tendency to, I guess, squeeze a nickel until the the duff, the buffalo pooped, as the saying goes. But I focused on my frugal efforts. I feel in some of the wrong places, and could have been a little bit better with that. And you know, live life, enjoy life, but still focus frugally on the big picture items, the big expenses. For instance, out of college, I didn't have a roommate. I, I lived by myself. I rented a place by myself. JW, I feel we're like we're like minds here. I think you're in the reluctant frugalist category. Frugal is a, a means to an end for you. Are we, am I on the same page? You're, you're definitely on the same page. It's definitely a means to an end. And what I love about that framework is a lot of times you may find that the needle shifts for you as you adopt this mindset for a long enough period of time and you see the freedom that it allows you to claw back. You don't necessarily just go back to just blowing through everything. You're, you're, you've been forced to be intentional for a long enough period of time that it's hard to just suddenly switch out of that and start spending money left and right. Yeah, exactly. And through our journey, we've optimized things on our expense side. Uh, along the way. And now it's like, we we're at this point, you look back, it's like, gosh, we could have done that maybe a little bit better uh, starting out. And, you know, that was, you know, focusing on the right places, but you know, you live and you learn. All right. And we have one quick bonus question for you. What was your favorite purchase that you made on amazon.com in the last year? All right. I'm going to go big on this one. It, it may, may rub some of the frugalists uh, a little bit the wrong way, but a few months ago, my wife and I bought a Roomba on Amazon, uh, an iRobot. So, you know, like one of those robots that roam around and vacuum your house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we bought um, one of the higher, there's all sorts of models these days, but we bought one of the higher end models is about 600 bucks. Um, so we threw down a, a big chunk of change on that one, but uh, we absolutely love it. And it's it's come with a number of side benefits that we wouldn't have imagined. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> our, our little uh, three-year-old now loves to clean up. He'll clean up all his toys, put them back where they go so that we can run the robot. And he, he loves to run over there and press the button and then watch the robot go. Uh, so it's been fun and it's provided us the, the kind of uh, getting a little bit of our weekend life back from vacuuming and, and uh, live in a, a little bit more of the lifestyle we are wanting to move into. It's so funny. You know, that that's that's hilarious. We actually stare at that thing every single time we walk by at, at Costco because they do have it there. And every once in a while, my wife, usually when I've been like slacking off on my side of the housework, will start mentioning that, oh, maybe we should consider getting a cleaning service to come in maybe once here and there. And inevitably, when that conversation starts happening, the the Roomba starts looking more attractive. And I'm thinking to myself, really don't want to hire a cleaning service, really don't want to do it. And I really don't want to clean more. So what's my next option? And oh, I could just automate my life. So no movement on that one way or the other. And probably it won't happen. But I do understand the appeal. Let's be realistic. I just need to clean more. <laughs> <laughs> it, it took us a little while to get there as well. But yeah, we, we love it though. All right, JW, thanks for sharing the time in the studio with us today and uh, giving us a chance to walk through your story. Lots of great stuff here and really opening up this this framework that we've been building, this story that we've been developing, and it just adds a new dimension to it. And we just appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Now, before you go, uh, we do just want to take a second. We're sure that there's a lot of people that are going to want to check out your blog, check out your content that you've been writing for the last year and a half. And also, you just recently came out with something called the Prowess Score, which there's been a fire lit around the blogosphere and a lot of people have been the, been developing their own prowess score. And I'm sure people are going to want to go check that out as well. Um, how can people connect with you? Yeah, the best way to connect with me, I'm on Twitter at 
The Green Swan One. Hit up my website at thegreenswan.org. And you can even shoot me an email at thegreenswan1 at gmail.com. And that's the numeric one, thegreenswan1 at gmail.com. Those are the best ways to connect with me. And yeah, the Fire Prowess score has kind of taken off in the last month or so. Rockstar Finance featured it and 25 other fire bloggers have joined the uh, the movement. So it's been it's been great. A lot of material there to read and uh, incorporate, hopefully, in, in everyone's uh, respective journeys toward fire. Yeah, it certainly is its own topic in and of itself. And we could have covered it today, but there wasn't enough time to do both. So maybe you'd be willing to come back on the show in a future episode and we can unpack the prowess score. Absolutely. Would love to. And uh, the pleasure has been all mine uh, joining you guys on the podcast today. So thank you, Brad and Jonathan, for having me on. All right, buddy. We'll talk soon. And thank you for being a part of the Chooseify community. If you want to support us, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. If you want to do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 38, The Why of FI, and right behind that, have them go listen to episode 21, The Pillars of FI. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.